The eyes of the world are on the devastation in Ukraine. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus knows that. The director general of the World Health Organization has seen how quickly the world can rally its attention and will to action, as many nations did last month when Russia attacked Ukraine, and yes, as many nations did early on in the COVID pandemic. And so, earlier this month, Gabrasius asked the international community to turn the power of that attention to people whose stories have not been on televisions around the world or command a trending hashtag. Although Ukraine is the focus of the world's attention, it's far from the only crisis to which WHO is responding. The situation in Tigray is catastrophic. I'm from Tigray. And this crisis affects me, my family and my friends, very personally. But as the Director General of WHO, I have a duty to protect and promote health wherever it's under threat. And there is nowhere on earth where the health of millions of people is more under threat than in Tigray. This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Tigray is a state in northern Ethiopia. It's home to the Tigrayan people, a relatively small ethnic group that's had an outsized influence on the country's history, not least by overthrowing the communist junta that had plunged Ethiopia into famine in the 1980s. A year and a half ago, Tigray's leaders rebelled against the prime minister, Abiy Ahmed. The Tigrayans came close to taking Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa. Ahmed responded forcefully, partnered with Eritrea, recruited militias from Tigray's rival ethnic groups, purchased drones bought from Turkey and the United Arab Emirates, attacking Tigrayan forces from the air. And then Prime Minister Ahmed put the entire state of Tigray under siege. No one and nothing is allowed in or out. No refugees, no aid workers, no fuel, no electricity, no internet, no medicine, no food. More than six million people have been sealed off from the outside world by Eritrean and Ethiopian forces for more than 500 days, the WHO director general recently tweeted. Starvation is being used as a weapon of war. People are dying. The blockade on communications, including on journalists being able to report from Tigray means it remains a forgotten crisis. Out of sight and out of mind. Well, four days ago, Tigrayan forces and the Ethiopian government agreed to a humanitarian ceasefire with the hope of getting some of the much needed aid into the region. However, there are reports yesterday of hundreds of Ethiopian troops converging on a town near the border of Tigray province. What about what's still happening inside Tigray state? Well, Dr. Rea Mengesha is a surgeon at the Eider Referral Hospital in Tigray. Over the weekend, he managed to bypass the internet blockade and send us a voice memo about what this siege is doing to his patients. There are so many patients who used to, to come to our hospital to get service. For instance, patients with cancer, chemotherapy. This was the only hospital uh, with, with complete you know, cancer treatment except for radiotherapy. But the chemotherapies are uh, now no more available. We have been using for the past one year uh, medications who, which were uh, you know, expired, you know, with expired dates for, for more than one year. But currently, we don't even have those, those drugs. So our cancer patients do not have any medications. Cancer patients, diabetes patients, Tigrayans needing dialysis. For 500 days, Dr. Rea has been unable to treat anyone. And patients on dialysis, we used to see our patients dying in front of our eyes because of lack of uh, dialysis. Those who were on chronic dialysis and those with acute also, uh, patients with acute renal failure who need dialysis, they die because of uh, the lack of the medications. We, we, we got very few uh, consumables, but that's not enough for the number of patients that we have. 500 days of an almost impenetrable blockade means Dr. Raya and his hospital now also lack critical necessities, even for basic hospital hygiene. For example, 
they have run out of new gloves. We used to use uh, double gloves when we do surgery. As a surgeon, I can tell you that. But we, can, we can't do that anymore. And we are using only single glove. And even after that, we have to wash it again and uh, reuse it after, after sterilization. So these are only a few, few of the things that can tell you how, how dire the situation is. Dr. Raya Mengesha, a surgeon at the Ida Referral Hospital in Tigray. Well, Dr. Hyalo Mekanin used to be the executive director of that same hospital. He came to the United States last May for a fellowship at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And he joins us now. Dr. Hyalom, welcome to On Point. Thank you very much for having me. Can you first describe to me what the Ida Referral Hospital was like before the blockade on Tigray province began 500 days ago? Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, Ida Referral Hospital was one of the largest hospital in the Northern Ethiopia. And it is also one of one of the university hospital in the country with more than 600 beds. And with that, it has a catchment area of 8 million, including of the northern, the whole northern part of Ethiopia, which includes Tigray and Afar regions, which is a regional state nearby, and also some of the zonal, the provinces of Amhara, like the northern Wollo and northern Gondar, and also the refugees. There is a huge population of refugees from Eritrea. They also came to the Eider Hospital. So Eider Hospital is the largest in that in that sense, mm. in catchment area. Mm. And you can also imagine it has also all speciality of services in the hospital. And we have more than 3,500 employees, both in academic and in hospital, and also in administration. Mm. So it was the largest of one of the largest in the country next to the black line in the capital and this Yes. So Dr. Hyalom, then what is the impact um, on the region that a hospital as critical as the Ida Referral Hospital has been under siege now? Uh, the whole region has for for 500 days. What's the brought? What's the impact of that? Yes. So what happened is now. Now, as I mentioned before, it was the largest. And then after the war broke out in November 2020, and either hospital is struggling, and to give services for the patients in need. And then there are three ways the hospital was affected by the conflict. One is a physical damage by an artillery and sometimes also by 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 lootings mm. from the conflict actors. And the other one is the patients because most of the health facilities in the region, around 80 to 90 percent, has damaged and systematically destroyed. So people have no way to go. And then they just came to either if they can gain services. And the problem is now the people, they just travel by foot because there is no car transportation, there is no transportation at all. Mm. So the people who are able to come to hospital, they couldn't find any services because there is no medicine and there is no any drugs. And 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 even the, the, the employees and colleagues on the ground, they have not paid their salary for 11 months. And then they themselves are struggling to survive mm. because they have also family and some of them are just fall down while they are conducting surgery in, in operating rooms. So it's a very, a very disturbing uh, uh, circumstance. Yes, Dr. Hyalom, just to be sure I understand uh, understood you correctly, when you said that some of the medical staff are falling down, you mean basically pass, passing out while trying to do surgeries and passing out due to, due to hunger, right? Because of the starvation that has set in in Tigray province, is that right? Yes, correct. It's because of hunger. They don't have anything to eat. Then they just go to help their patients. And in the meantime, they become hypoglycemic and then they fall down on the corridor. So that's how urgent the food need is in the province. Yes, yes. It's really repressing that unless we make an intervention international community, we'll see a catastrophic of mass deaths in the coming few weeks. 
Dr. Hyalom, you left Tigray province in what, May of last year. You still have family there. H- have you heard yeah. from them? Yeah, I, I couldn't because I have family back home and, and my, my little kids are there. And I couldn't hear them for the last 500 days when I arrived here in the United States. I don't know whether they are surviving or they die. I'm just watching in my eyes. I always cry all day and the night that, that how are my family doing there? And I couldn't hear what's happening to them. So you can imagine that every Tigrayan living in the United States and elsewhere in the world are living in horror because they couldn't listen and hear their family back home. So we are really in a very difficult situation. So total information blackout, along with the food and uh, medical blockade that's going on there, Dr. Hayalom, what was it like even just before you left? Because it wasn't that long ago that you left, and this has been going on since 2020, as you said. Yeah, before I left, there was a little bit, very small aids was coming, and very small... Uh, uh, medicines are coming through the road. At least the road was not completely sealed off on that time. It was very small, but at least people started to struggling to get that. And then life was a little bit better. But after June, it was a complete blackout. It was yeah. a complete siege. Even no one is allowed to leave and no one is allowed to enter. Dr. Hyalom, so I, I have some, so sorry yeah. I have to take a very quick break, but very quickly, quickly, can you tell me how old are your children? Yeah, my children, is, my daughter is nine years old and my son is five years old. <sighs> are very kids. Dr. Hyalom Mekanen, stand by for a moment. We are talking about the humanitarian catastrophe in Tigray province in northern Ethiopia. This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, and today we are talking about the humanitarian crisis in Tigray province in northern Ethiopia. The director general of the WHO recently called the blockade that's been going on there for more than 500 days as making Tigray province the most dangerous place on planet Earth for human Health. Some 6 million people face the possibility of starvation there now, and the WHO Director General has called starvation as being used as a weapon of war. And I'm joined today by Dr. Hyalom Mekanen. He's, a former, he's the former executive director of Ida Referral Hospital in Tigray province. He's now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And Dr. Hyalom, if you can just hang on here for another minute, I'd like to bring in Itana Dinka into the conversation, associate professor of history at James Madison University. Professor Dinka, welcome to you. Thank you very much. So first of all, um, I would just love to hear your response to what Dr. Hyalom has been describing about the conditions in in Tigray right now. What would you like to add to that? What more do you think we should know? Yeah, the situation in Tigray right now is uh, seriously um, frightening for a number of reasons, Uh, like uh, the doctor from Tigray said, and many other humanitarian organizations uh, brought out the situation there um, is putting millions of lives in a serious risk, which unfortunately the government in Addis Ababa is very, very happy to see because the government in Addis Ababa could not humiliate and achieve some mission um, of the government of Tigray through war and it is trying through starvation. The world um, looks at the situation in Tigray uh, as a disaster, but unfortunately, the government in Addis Ababa looks at it as a useful political tool. Hmm. So then, take us back, I guess, to the relative beginning of this current conflict there. How did it begin? Um, the beginning of this conflict uh, goes um, as far as 1991, when the military regime was overthrown by a coalition of Tigray People's Liberation uh, Front, 
and Eritrean Liberation Front that uh, overthrew uh, the government in this hour, and then TPLF got an opportunity to establish a government um, where it, rem it remained dominant for nearly uh, three decades. As a movement in many parts of Oromia, the protest uh, in many parts of Oromia and other regions in Ethiopia uh, pushed that domination to the margin. Uh, the opportunity was rather hijacked uh, by uh, politicians um, who liked to uh, take Ethiopia back to the situation before 1991, uh, when Ethiopia was organized, the state was organized under a unitary form of uh, government. Now, the government in Addis Ababa was, uh, is wishing to reorganize the state in a unitary form by reversing uh, achievements of multinational uh, uh, multinational federalism. Now, the, the conflict in Tigray is a result of the failure of the political transition that Ethiopia triggered in April 2018, when the mass movement in Oromia and other parts of the country uh, defeated the EPRDF rule where TPLF was dominant. Mm -hmm. Now, the government in Addis Ababa is dominated by ardent enemies of multinational federation who believe that the anchor of this multinational federalism is in Tigray. And they believe Tigray must be humiliated, must be defeated. And they say this in public many times, if Tigray is defeated, other parts of Ethiopia would be easy to be ruled at gunpoint. Okay. But you, that is not the reality, of course. So, so Professor, if, if, just to clarify something, because to when you when you talk about Ethiopia's fundamental, you know, fundamental multinational nature, now that phrase multinational means something particular, say, to American ears. What exactly do you mean by that? By multinational, I mean Ethiopia is a country of many nations, many cultures, many languages. And the existing um, constitution, the constitution of 1995, um, was promulgated by taking this diversity into consideration. That is a constitution that allows regions and multiple nations in the country considerable aut autonomy to rule themselves. Uh, but now the government of Abiy Ahmed wanted to concentrate all political powers, economic powers, in Addis Ababa by undercutting regional autonomy. That is what Tigray refused, and that is the basic cause of conflict and the basic cause of the crisis that Ethiopia found itself in right today. I see. So the uh, 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 an analogy to put it in, again, familiar terms for, for me and American listeners would be if the federal government in Washington, D.C., for example, wanted to seize a lot of power that was uh, traditionally granted to the, the states in the United States. Does that sound like Perfect. a... Perfect. Okay, okay. So, 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 Dr. Hyalom, can I just turn back to you here for a moment? Since, um, you know, as the as the former executive director of a critically important hospital in in Tigray, how important was that regional autonomy uh, uh, that Professor Etana Dinka is talking about? How important was that in in Tigray, even for doing things like like you were describing earlier, um, providing uh, medical and health care? Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think the, he, he articulates very well that uh, this federal structure is very, very helpful for the nation as general to Tigray and also to Ethiopia because all of exercise in language, so everybody is exercised its own culture, its own language, and its own administration. So Tigray for instance, if we take that in our hospital, we used to, to administer by our own, and also we speak our own language, and also we exercise. And the people who are coming from the hospital are also the same. So if you think that if, if this federal system has to be abolished, and then what will happen is there is no way that people can exercise or can administer themselves in a way that it is in the federal state. So this unilateral system, which was supposed now to be imposed on Tigray, on the rest of Ethiopia, 
is in other word it is only promote only one culture and one language which a country is constituted of more than 83 culture and language so this means when we come to a medical term when we come to health sector that means the power is decentralized so people can manage plan and execute what they have in their own prejudice or in their own judiciaries so there is no way that somebody come from Addis and impose you to do this, 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 on this, and then you should not do this. So this way of administration is not really helpful. Mm. So mm. the reason now, even the country blooming in the last three decades is because of decentralization of power to the nation, to the to the systems, not concentrated in a disordered central way. I so see. this is how it helps. I yes. see, I see. So Professor Etana Dinka, when, when Dr. Hyalom talks about uh, um, uh, Prime Minister uh, Abi Ahmed not just wanting to centralize um, Ethiopia politically, but also culturally and linguistically, can you talk about that for a moment? Professor Etana Dinka, are you there? We'll try to get him back. Dr. Hyalom, let me just keep uh, uh, hearing more from you then. So what I'm curious to know is that why do you think that 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 uh, Abi turned to Eritrea um, in his in in his uh, desire to push back against sort of Tigrayan autonomy, if I can put it that way? Yeah. I think that's a very good question because you know Eritrea was was really quite in language and in culture that are more related to Tigrayans than the rest of Ethiopia. And what happened was there was a war was broke out in 1990s, and then that war was uh, uh, happened between Ethiopia and Eritrea. But the Eritrean regime think that the war is orchestrated by the ruling party of Tigray. And then they they have a very high resentment towards the leadership of Tigray. But later on, and this was exploited by a regime that when he want to, to subjugate the society and the ruling regime of Tigray, he thinks that Eritrea will help him to eradicate this leadership and to some to to let the population to submission because the Eritrean is an arch enemy of the PLF and the Tigray. So he used that and he invited the Eritrea and then the Eritrea they are not only against the leadership but they are against the poor people. Mm. So they looted, they kill and they and also they just like rape all girls and women. Around 120,000 girls and women has been raped by Eritrean mainly, and also the Amhara, which has also a contested area with Tigray regime. They also uh, decimated and killed and cleansing of the Tigrayan population in the western side of Tigray, which is a contested area with, with Amhara. So now suppose, suppose, if one of the United States was rebellion against uh, the, uh, the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And suppose if the Biden invited a Russia, a Putin, to, to subdue one of the state of the United States. So you can imagine how atrocity will be happened to one of the state of the United States, which have been invited by Biden administration. So it, it's as simple as that. So you can imagine how Putin will be mercilessly killed the people of the United States and a state was invited to kill the people. Mm. So this was how what was happened in, in, in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia. Oh, I see. Uh, I think we have Professor uh, Itana Dinka back. Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, uh, sorry for those technical difficulties that uh, that we had there for uh, uh, for a minute or two. But can you also just spend a minute or two telling me more um, about what Dr. Hyalom was, was describing? Uh, I, I had, had asked about whether um, uh, uh, where whether Abi Ahmed's uh, centralizing vision wasn't just uh, a political centralization, but also a cultural and linguistic one. Absolutely. Um, right now, what is going on uh, in Ethiopia is 
an attempt to effectively reverse what the country achieved in trying to recognize its internal diversity. Now, it's important to have in mind that Ethiopia was created as an empire by the close of the 19th century. It was an empire in every sense of the word, and that word is not a misnomer. Ethiopia struggled for decades to transit uh, its identity from being an empire to a state with coherent national identity. Mm. That is, to impose a singular language, a singular culture, and religion upon every part of the country. Imperial Ethiopia did not recognize Islam. A very large community in Ethiopia even did not recognize other versions of Christianity other than Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So by 1974, a revolution broke out and that forced the country to recognize Islam legally and other forms of religions. And the military regime tried its best, although it was violent and, and carried out frightening, killed frightening number of people, it tried um, somehow to recognize diversity of the country. Now, the government in Addis Ababa is very much after restoring imperial style type of administration mm-hmm. in terms of politics, in terms of culture. Now, we are talking about Tigray, um, and uh, we are um, right to talk about that because there is, there is a serious problem in Tigray. But every part of Ethiopia is in a problem because the government in Addis Ababa wanted to impose a singular political system on a very diverse, huge Horn of Africa state. Mm. Now we have a hidden war going on, which the world has unfortunately no opportunity to observe in the larger state in Oromia. Yes. In the western part of the country, in Benishangul, conflicts are commonplace. So the Tigray situation is a climax and um, the, the very difficult situation. Uh, where the people is living. So the, the imposition from Addis Ababa uh, is political, economic, and cultural. And the country tried this. The problem is the country tried this for decades. Mm. It failed. Yes. It laid the country into civil wars between 1991 and um, between 1974 and 1991, which laid into a, a military solution yes. to overthrow a country in, in, in a government in Addis Ababa. But Abiy Ahmed is trying that again. Okay. Uh, Prof- Professor, stand by for a moment because I have to let uh, Dr. Hyalom go in just a minute here. Um, and Doctor, I'm so grateful that you could join us today, especially given um, the heartache you must be experiencing every day, not even being able to hear from your tiny children who are still in Tigray. I have a minute left with you. What do you think, what do you feel when you, when you watch the world focusing so much on the devastation in, in Ukraine, um, knowing that uh, six million Tigrayans we have we can't and haven't heard from them i just what would you like the world to know to do yeah i think uh, you know the world it, it's good that they focused on ukraine because of the invasion manner or nature of the russians on ukrainian territory and uh, and integrity but the worst scenario or the worst humanitarian catastrophe is in tigray so international community at least has to give an attention to the more than six million with no medicine, with no food, with no communication for more than a year. But in Ukraine, at least the fighters or the fighting has allowed humanitarian uh, trust and then convey and foods are getting to the people. But in Tigra, it was a complete blockage that there is no or what's happening in Tigray is nobody knows. Mm. So at least they have to pressurize the government in Addis and the food and the medicine to be allowed. Yes. Well, Dr. Hyalo Mekonin, joining us today from Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you so much, doctor. We'll be right back.
This is On Point. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, and today we are focusing on the humanitarian crisis in the northern Ethiopian state of Tigray. For more than 500 days, the government of Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has imposed an almost total blockade on Tigray state, meaning no one in or out, no communications, no food, no medicine, uh, virtually nothing being able to uh, get into Tigray. And therefore, more than six million people face starvation now. The director general of the WHO has called the crisis in Tigray the most dangerous place for human health on planet Earth. I'm joined today by Itana Dinka. He's an associate professor of history at James Madison University. I'd like to bring into the conversation now Ephraim Isaac. He joins us from Princeton, New Jersey. Ephraim is chair of the board of the Ethiopian Peace and Development Center and a scholar on Ethiopian culture and history as well. Ephraim, welcome to On Point. Thank you very much. You know, I note that it was just three years ago in 2019 that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was granted, was given the Nobel Peace Prize for being instrumental in ending the uh, war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And yet now he has uh, recruited Eritrea in the, in the subjugation of Tigray province. Can you just talk about that? What, what has changed between 2019 and 2022? Uh, regarding Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Thank you very much. First of all, let me say my heart goes out to the people of Tigray who are suffering the unspeakable tragedy that was described by Dr. Theodros and Dr. Hayalom. Um, Dr. Theodros, I've known personally a good friend, and uh, it is really unbelievable. Uh, however, uh, I am personally concerned about the suffering that's going all over that country, mm. as Dr. Itana also implied, and uh, we are sleepless. We pray to God that the eyes of the leaders of Ethiopia will be opened. Specifically with your question, uh, I am not a political scientist. Mm. Uh, there are many people who interpret what exactly happened. Um, I don't think I'm the right person to give you the answer for the question that you you answered, um, you asked. However, uh, other people also say that uh, the Nobel Prize Committee was in a rush to uh, give this prize. Uh, again, I'm not a judge mm. and I cannot uh, determine on what basis uh, and uh, why this process was uh, completed. Um, there are others also who have raised questions about uh, what was the agreement between uh, the Prime Minister and President Tayas. Uh, I think there are others who are more qualified than me to speak to that. Okay. My own desire is that the people of Ethiopia and Eritrea also need to make peace. Yes. Well, so then, so then, let's discuss more about what uh, what uh, Professor Itana Dinka was talking um, to us about before that last break about the the multi multi ethnic, multicultural, multi religious nature of Ethiopia. Uh, I mean, it's fundamental diversity. Do you see? Um, uh, Prime Minister Ahmed as trying to as as also as trying to reverse that sort of fundamental truth about what Ethiopia is. Uh, let me myself go to the issue of human nature. The truth of the matter is, political unity is based on a contract, on a covenant. For instance, Switzerland is made up of Germans, Italians, and French. It's a strong country. It's a very wealthy country. They made a covenant to be one people. When you look at Germany and Austria, they're the same people. They speak the same language, but they've not made a covenant. So they are different 
countries. So the issue, quite often when people speak about uh, uh, what makes a country a unity, it's really not whether the country is made up of different ethnic groups or different linguistic groups, but the fact that that particular country has a group of people who have made a covenant, like husband and wife. Mm. The husband may be tall, the wife might be short, the wife might be tall, but they make a covenant and get married. So my own take is whether we have uh, a group of different nationalities in Ethiopia or different linguistic groups, that is true. But whether we have a nation, a people who live together, is a matter of covenant. Mm. Again, I can give you many. The United States of America, each state has made a covenant with all related American constitution. So, uh, personally, my take is uh, a, a conflict within a country. It's not a matter of whether they are one ethnic group or different. It's a matter of a political covenant. Yes, understood. Uh, and I completely agree with you on that. So the question is, what happens when when fundamental aspects of that covenant are broken? And so, Professor uh, Itana Dinka, let me turn to you on this, because uh, if I remember correctly, at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, Prime Minister Abiy essentially, uh, what, he postponed the, the elections in, in Ethiopia in 2020. Uh, but that was in violation, speaking of covenants, of the Ethiopian constitution. So who is doing the breaking of that fundamental uh, political agreement, that, that covenant that uh, Ephraim Isaac is, is talking about? Thank you. Very uh, interesting question. Uh, uh, let me put uh, one point uh, uh, before you, be before I respond to the question. Um, the uh, crisis that came to Ethiopia is, is deeply embedded in history, like, like I uh, raised it earlier. And Ethiopia's problem um, are too complex to be solved in a short run. Mm -hmm. But... Regarding the crisis Ethiopia found itself in today, mostly the problem was caused by deliberate, conscious decision of the government in Addis Ababa. For example, the point that you raised about postponing election. The election was postponed, and that was one point that illustrates the tendency of the government in Addis Ababa. Tigray refused because it said it wanted to respect the existing constitution. The government in Addis Ababa did not care about existing constitution. But Abiy Ahmed and his government came to, came to power by swarming under this existing constitution. Therefore, the decision from Addis Ababa to postpone election was to maneuver situations on behalf of the government in Addis Ababa between the postponement of election and the uh, holding election in 2021. If you take the 12 months between the decision of Addis Ababa to postpone election and until the, the, the election was held only a few months ago, major opponents of the government were either arrested or killed. Mm. It cleared off the political field of the opposition and held what it called election. It wasn't election by strict definition. It was done without any competition, without, without any rivalry in Oromia and in many parts of the country. Tigray had this, this war started in 2020 because it made a decision to hold election, not election outside its region, election to establish its own government on its own land. And that proved to the Ethiopian peoples that pandemic could not be a reason to postpone an election because Tigray had done it in the midst of pandemic. And that became a threat 
to the government in Addis Ababa. I don't mean that this is a, the basic cause, but it became a, a factor that that um, made the decision of Addis Ababa to go to war quickly mm. by inviting Eritrea mm. uh, into the war. I see. So we've got only roughly about five minutes left in this conversation, um, gentlemen, and I. I just want to re- restate the, the truth about what's happening on the ground uh, in Tigray, right? As, as I mentioned earlier, the WHO considers it the most dangerous place on earth right now for human health. There's more than 5 million people who are at risk of death due to starvation at the moment. No electricity, no telecommunications, no banking, no air transport in, and, in or out of the, of the region. Uh, and I mean, the, the the government of Prime Minister Abiy has just has denied uh, entry of food and fuel and medical supplies. Now, we have a current ceasefire, which we hope holds. But the U.N. says that right now to reach the millions of people who are who are suffering there, it would take more than 100 truckloads of supplies, food and medical uh, supplies every day to stave off this disaster. So Ephraim, Isaac, let me just ask you, there are many, many times in in recent history, recent world history, where the international community has looked upon similar situations, right? The deliberate starvation by a government of its own people, uh, the use of, 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 of rape as a weapon of war, um, the, the the terrorizing and subjugation of different ethnic groups and the world has said has said we cannot stand by while this happens and some action has been taken sometimes military action more often now sanctions for example i mean what do you think the international community ought to ought to do at least at the moment so that some help can get into to the people of tigray first of all it is a shame when the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has become the story of every minute, of every channel. Yet conflicts happening in a black continent in Africa, they, they are not even uh, on, on one channel for a long time. So this is a shame. Uh, I think others have spoken to this. Let me, however, myself uh, uh, really uh, uh, say something that uh, um, I would like to uh, emphasize. Ethiopian culture since ancient times was founded in Tigray. Tigray is actually a very important component. It's Tigray is the mother of Ethiopia, the ancient church of Aksum, the Giz language, the early translation of the Bible, the ancient monasteries, they're all found in Tigray. So Tigray is basically, don't present the Tigray people as some are the alien. They are the founders of the Ethiopian civilization. And the Amhara and the Tigray are actually twin brothers. They are almost the same people. And this is why, as I said before, conflict is not necessarily based on one political system or one. It is when people make a covenant and live together. The Amhara and Tigray are actually the same people. And the Oromo also, if you go back to ancient times, the Akushitic people are part of the early peoples of Ethiopia. The DNA, you see, the conflict in the world, as I said, is, as Freud says, is, is really psychological. It's not the fact that we are different religions or different tribes. Russia and Ukraine, by the way, <laughs> pretty much uh, uh, the Orthodox Church started in, uh, in, in Kiev uh, and the Russians are Orthodox. So the conflicts are often based on issues of psychological and what our, our own problem goes back to the 60s mm. when young Ethiopians living abroad completely neglected the study of Ethiopian history, culture, the Oromo, the Amhara and the Tigray and turned to the study of Marxism, Leninism. They turned into, they were students of Marcuse who were talking about uh, revolution, power comes out of the barrel of the gun. And in fact, many of the people today who are shouting Ethiopia, Ethiopia, don't know its history, its mm. culture. It is very sad. And that if they did that, 
what they know is they've read Machiavelli, they have read uh, uh, Hobbes, they've not read Christoph Samra, Zara Jacob, Ethiopian teachers who teach love, yes. love each other. Yes. And, and, and forgive each other. Mm. And, uh, well, I'm so sorry to step in here, um, Ephraim, but I only have about a minute and a half left. And I, there's one last question that I would like to turn to uh, Professor Itana Dinka. Uh, Professor, I'm thinking about um, one of the reasons potentially why the international community has not done more, and specifically the United States at the moment. It's because there are influential people in the United States who consider Prime Minister Abe an ally, right? I mean, I'm seeing that Jeffrey Feltman, the former U.S. Special Envoy to the Horn of Africa, has, you know, spoken um, uh, in admiring tones about the Abe regime. And that, um, you know, in addition, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Under Secretary, excuse me, I, I should get this right, Assistant Secretary of State, Tibor Nagy, has talked about the admiration uh, that the United States has for the supposedly um, economic liberalizing aims of the Ethiopian government right now. Are those factors uh, that play into why there hasn't been more done? Thank you. This is um, one important question. Um, I'm afraid we only have 30 seconds, Professor. My apologies. Okay. The, the United States is already uh, being marginalized in the uh, uh, roles it has in the Horn of Africa. And the approach it takes towards this Addis Ababa is a kind of begging from, from the margin. And unfortunately, the United States is now bowing down uh, to the uh, manipulation of Addis Ababa. Because, like Pedro's, um, um, uh, the leader of World Lead Heads Organization, Pedro's Gabriel Adhanom, said earlier, uh, the government is using starvation as a weapon mm. of war, but the United States is not calling out that. Yes. I, I, my deepest apologies that I have to wrap this up, this conversation up now. But Professor Itana Dinka and Ephraim Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. This is On Point. <laughs>